Hey, everyone. Can you all hear me? Okay, cool. Excellent. Um, thank you for having me. Thanks for coming to my talk. Um, I just have one bit of housekeeping to add to that list. Uh, my slides contain a lot of flashing content. In fact, they're almost exclusively GIFs. So if you're, <laughs> if you're photo sensitive, I, I apologize. This might not be um, comfortable for you to um, look at. So I'm Dora Militaru. I'm um, you know, that unicorn full stack developer. I mostly write JavaScript. Um, and I work for a news organization called the Financial Times. Um, and um, I really love working at the Financial Times for many, many reasons. I've had the privilege to travel a lot lately, and they always give out the paper free on the airplane, and it makes me feel a little bit proud of myself. Um, I used to lead the team that implemented GDPR and FT.com at the beginning of this year. I have since retired from FT.com unrelated to GDPR, and I work on um, really exciting experimental internal uh, projects. And I've had, for as long as I can remember in my career as a developer, an interest in web performance. And this talk is strangely inspired by that interest, and it, it draws from you know, like a deeply personal experience um, of attending my first ever web performance meetup. Um, and this was before I was a jobbing engineer, and it was hosted at the FT, um, incidentally. And I was late, because I'm always late. And I entered the room, and it's full. And there were maybe like two seats at the back, so I sat down. And the talk was really, really exciting. Um, but I felt really intimidated looking around, because it was a lot like this. <laughs> Um, so you don't need a lot of imagination to figure out what the word I I'm not going to say. Um, and what, what it made me do is it, it, it made me feel a little bit uncomfortable and on the back foot, and I had some questions that all seemed stupid to me after the talk, and I, I, everybody seemed like they knew each other. Um, and there was no one like me in the room, so I couldn't really take advantage of the networking because I'm quite shy um, and you know it just wasn't a very positive experience I don't know if anyone can relate to this it's kept happening to me a few times so I've been to like an IETF panel on quick where someone the organizers took photos and live tweeted the whole event and someone on Twitter was outraged on my behalf because I was the only woman in the room um, and that was, again, strange because the conversation didn't include me. Um, and this happens so often that it is baked into our implicit associations. And I really apologize about this, Jim, but you know, you said, OK, we're going to have a 30-minute break now, um, and then we're back to talk about where are the women. Thanks, guys. So that sort of thing. <laughs> I had to do it. I had to do it. This happens all the time. And this happens never. So this, is <laughs> in, in, in the spirit of festive cheer, this is why I want to, I want to ask, where are the women? Because there's nothing I could talk about diversity to uh, spell out Christmas. OK. Um, do we still have this problem? So I look around, and I see women in the audience. There are um, fellow female speakers at this um, conference. And I work with quite a few badass women. So my principal engineer is a woman. Our um, CIO is a woman. Um, the head of cybersecurity is a woman. I have lots of very talented female colleagues on my team. Um, so what is, what is my problem? Is this question still relevant? Mm. OK, I'm, my problem is that I'm white, and I'm young, and I'm female, and I was born female, and I'm a European citizen, and I've traveled to maybe seven countries in the past two months, and no one's asked me to balance a binary search tree at immigration. And this happened to a Nigerian developer called Celestine Omin when he tried to go to a conference in the States. Um, I never got randomly searched at the airport, and I, you know, I get paid to code, so I'm living the dream. But not everybody's as lucky as me, because we still live in a world where someone's gender, sexual orientation, religion, class, age, and even geography can give them more or fewer opportunities for success. And some people just have to work 10 times as hard. Um, 
and to get to the same place. So I want to ask why that is and how we can fix it. But first, I'd like to tell you a story. So the year is 2017, and that's the year Donald Trump was inaugurated as the new president of the United States, um, and England decided to divorce the European Union. And in my own country, Romania, there were the, the most widespread um, protests um, since the fall of communism. So my future was looking very geographically uncertain. And I thought, that's a great opportunity to do what I've always wanted to do, which is quit my job as a technical product owner and write code for a living. Um, and because of that, I was in equal parts happy, but also terrified when the Financial Times offered me a job. Um, because I'd been coding for a while, and then I joined, and I realized very quickly that I knew nothing. And then something else happened. So a few weeks into my new job, um, someone called James Damore, a Google employee, circulated um, an internal memo that then got leaked. And among other things, Damore argued that women, that the fact that women are biologically and psychologically different from men explains why there are fewer female engineers and why we're less likely to be successful in this profession. Now, I was already feeling like an imposter, and this obviously didn't help, but James Damore's memo and the internet discussion around it made me realize that tech is still an unwelcoming place for a lot of people. Um, but what it did do is it got everyone talking about diversity, and it highlighted for you know possibly the first time in a very public way um, that our industry is still pretty homogenous and exclusive. So I tuned into this conversation because I just wanted to understand why we can't all agree on, on something that will obviously make the world a better place, uh, which is to fix this imbalance in, in opportunity um, that we have in tech. So from there on, I started listening to all sides of the debate. And the first thing I noticed was that people talk about numbers a lot. Um, so I'm going to start with the Financial Times. Now, my personal experience is that we have a great culture and we really value an environment where everyone feels safe. But how, div how diverse are we? So globally, the FT employs slightly more women than men. And at board level, female representation is 36%, which is well above the European average and the UK average implicitly. And by 2022, the FT have committed to reaching gender parity in the senior leadership team. So like a lot of larger companies, the FT have something called a diversity quota. And people have strong feelings about these targets or quotas because the prevailing argument is that they're anti-meritocratic and it feels um, I don't know, random and unfair to have numerical requirements for hiring and promoting people based on diversity attributes like gender, ethnicity, race, and so on. And I've also heard many variants of, I was hired because I'm a woman, and also, more worryingly, accusation, they were hired because they're a token person of some sort. But personally, I have two problems with um, diversity quotas. And the first one is that they can make it seem that it is, I don't know, diversity is a side project of your HR or talent team and nobody else has any responsibility. And the second one is that they can trick us into thinking that once we've hit a number, then boom, problem solved, um, and we fixed inequality. And I just wish it were that simple, because it's not. So I'd like to give you an example. This is um, one of my favorite TV shows is Mad Men. I see some knowing glances. Um, so Mad Men is about an ad agency in, um, in the US. Uh, called Sterling Cooper, and it's set in the uh, late 50s, early 60s. And Sterling Cooper, OK, technical problems. <laughs> Help. <laughs> um, right. This is a good slide. Um, yeah, going to unplug it and plug it back in. See if that helps. Sort of. OK, one second. Apologies. 
I think I'll have to restart the slideshow. I'm not quite sure what happened there. Just bear with me. Anyway, has anyone seen Mad Men? Anything strike you as unequal about that? <laughs> <laughs> Getting there. Ah, I forgot all my jokes. This is this is this hasn't happened to me before. Okay, here we are. Okay, Mad Men, Sterling Cooper. Sterling Cooper have gender parity because every man has a secretary. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you can't even take um, companies' diversity statistics at face value, and you always have to ask extra questions. Like um, the one I always tend to ask is, what is your gender pay gap? And in the UK, nine out of 10 women work for a company that pays them less for the same role. And um, more than half of men work for a company where the gender pay gap is over 10% in their favor. So we can't make this mistake of thinking that um, enforcing diversity targets is enough to ensure fairness and equality. So it's important to recognize that these targets are flawed. But you have to ask yourself, do we live in a society where privilege plays no part in opportunity? Um, does merit truly equal effort plus ability? And the answer to both these questions is no. And as long as this is true, <coughs> diversity quotas are, remain necessary, but are obviously not sufficient, because they may be the only way of achieving a world where they're obsolete. So yeah, we tend to talk about men and women and gender balances and quota a lot, because we spent thousands of years shaping and rationalizing gender roles. But it's 2018 now, and that conversation needs to shift, because demographics are not binary. Demographics are a spectrum. And if you argue about diversity along one dimension or another, um, it's, it's, it's fighting for a kind of diversity that benefits one group of people over another. And it, it completely ignores the challenges that are at the intersection of, say, being a woman and a person with a disability or a person of color and non-binary. And I think the kind of diversity that's worth fighting for is this intersectional diversity that um, means that more people from different races and cultures and walks of life and people of all abilities and any or no gender um, can rub shoulders in anything from VC meetings to to fashion shows, um, and that you know maybe one day working class kids won't have to get working class jobs, and more of us can lead lives free of discrimination and stigma. Um, so, how do we convince people to care about this kind of diversity? What? Why is diversity? Why should it be the important tech? If you Google that, you'll come across. Um, lots and lots of results that three pages are all to the first three pages are all to the same tune of diversity is good for tech because it's good for business and there's data from recent research of um sort of consultancies like bcg and deloitte so this is really good established research uh, that shows that diverse companies are more productive more innovative and uh, more profitable and there's also research that shows that less diverse companies are less profitable. So there's a study by McKinsey that um, conclusively proved that companies with the, the least diverse leadership were 25% more likely to financially underperform um, and have returns below their industry medians. And that's a huge figure. Trouble is, statistics like these, they're great for getting executive buy-in for diversity initiatives, but they're not good for much else because this is, is good for business is the thing you give to someone who's just so uninterested in making the world a better place for anyone but themselves that it's good for business is all you have. And it's good for business doesn't make a difference um, to the opinions of an engineer. It's 
like it's not my battle cry because it doesn't actually help with fixing unfairness and equality and it doesn't help us build diverse workplaces or conferences or panels from the ground up and also it's super boring because to quote a dear colleague um, because uh, someone outside of your company I don't care if it needs me or people like me to be better itself so we need a different kind of argument um, I think Caring about diversity requires a moral argument that acknowledges inequity because there is systemic inequity in access to education, access to employment, and, and we have these stereotypes that persist uh, around race and gender and wealth and social class. And even our institutions, anything from education to politics, come with unequal outcomes built in that benefit some people uh, more than others. And, and these are all facts. And if you think about it, diversity statistics, anything from minorities in politics or you know, women in secondary education, they're actually a good barometer for social justice and equality. And the more people understand this in, in the finer nuances, the more we have a chance to change. Um, and the, and the, more, the more society as a whole begins to care about the issue. And ignorance is part of the oppression. And no one's going to argue with a moral argument for fixing diversity problem. Okay, like maybe bad people will argue um, because, you know, or ignorant people, but we're all good people here and good people like you and me are going to uh, use their inquisitive minds um, to find ways to fix this once we've acknowledged that it is a problem because the lack of diversity perpetuates injustice and is in turn perpetuated by injustice. When did that disappear? <laughs> can, can you just wave at me, please? Oh, goodness. So sorry. <laughs> OK, here we go. I am, if this happens again, I will just do it off the cuff and without slides. But you'd be missing out on like 80 great gifts. <laughs> We enjoying the gift so far? Yeah. Too much? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great, great. <laughs> okay, fingers crossed that this will actually work this time. Did you see this one? Great. <laughs> oh, no. is, is there anything we can do about this? Can someone lend me their laptop? I don't know. But then you can't see the GIFs. This is, this is a catch-22 now. OK. I wish I was as graceful as Das Sermo because I genuinely don't know what to do now. I can't keep you entertained. And it's not even live coding, so it's not like I have an excuse. Let's try this one more time. It's just Google Slides you use it. It is. Do you yeah. want to try and run it from this one? Yes. Can I share it with you? Where can I send it? Well, then I have to log into Google and everything. Okay. Perhaps. Okay, I shall try a different browser. That's a good point. Safari to the rescue. I don't think I've used it this year. You're all very patient. Thank you. OK, take three. Third time lucky is what they say.
get my bookmarks away. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so right, we've established that we're all good people here and we care about diversity. Um, um, but the trouble is that sometimes good people say and do things not for the intrinsic value of those things, but because of what they say about us. Um, your joke. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> this is not good. Okay. <laughs> so there's a lot of this self-congratulating focus on <laughs> diversity, and it's called something, um, it's called virtue signaling. And it happens on Twitter a lot, and it's basically about proving how right on you are, and uh, that you you know you care about the right things, and you're shouting about the wrongs in the world. Uh, in other words, you give a shit. But this almost invariably comes from a position of privilege, and it's super unhelpful. And it's sometimes so noisy that we uh, we maybe we don't notice that the progress we've made is not sufficient or that our implementation is slipping. So you really can't be naive and idealistic about this. Because the space between caring and not giving a shit is in a follow-up. And you know, you, you, purpose is not enough. You, c you can't create change without considerate implementation. So you have to find your own reason to care beyond this, this moral case for diversity. And what I often do is I frame things from a selfish perspective. So most of us are invested in enriching our own lives, but we don't live in a void. This richness comes from the world around us, from, from gaining something called cognitive diversity. In other words, diversity of thought and knowledge and experience. And this is something most of us aim for as individuals. And uh, you know, we do this through the, uh, the pursuits we seek out, through our aspirations in life, um, through our quest for knowledge, and, and also the people we connect with. And compared to everything else, we spend a lot of time at work, usually, for a significant portion of our lives. And we come to trust our colleagues, and we form these circles of implicit trust. And we rely on one another to, I don't know, share ideas, um, and make decisions and solve problems together, and also to socialize. We turn to our leaders for direction and advice, and uh, we look for their support. And we're also usually very grateful to receive it. In turn, we offer our support to others at work and beyond, and we give emotional support. We make friends. We form inner circles. So in other words, we are natural networkers. We create these informal social networks through which we diversify our thought and experience. And these informal networks are something called cognitive social structures. Uh, cognitive social structures have been widely studied since the 90s, and much like other kinds of network structures, we have um, established for frameworks to analyze them. And all of this is making for a really interesting reading. So there's an associated field called organizational network analysis, where by analyzing the informal networks in an organizations, we, we can um, gain um, insight into the likely financial performance and, and other indicators like that in a company. So I was researching all of this, and I came across a really interesting study in the Harvard Business Review. And the study was underpinned by network data gathered from a large <laughs> service provider. Um, but, and they, they gained this network data through surveying all employees of this organization. And they asked questions like, whom would you trust to discuss a work-related issue, or with one day of training, whose job could you step into, or whom would you recruit to support a proposal of yours that might prove unpopular? And the researchers oh. then mapped these connections uh, between people onto directed graphs, because if you've noticed, all of these questions would usually have someone's name as an answer. And these directed graphs uh, were, were then used to represent the various informal networks in the workplace. And what the researchers also did was map binary gender onto all vertices and edges. So this gave me an idea. I decided to run a few simulations um, of what informal networks might look like using the FT senior leadership um, team's 36-64 gender split. So this is a directed 
graph, uh, and in a directed graph, all vertices have an in degree and an out degree, meaning so the in degree is the number of edges which are coming into a verti vertex, and the out degree is the edges that are coming out. And the first thing I looked at was what would happen if, um, when the degrees of all these vertices in, in, the, in the graphs were arranged in ascending or descending order, which is something called a degree sequence. And I did this for a few random simulations, and they told me nothing that surprised me too much. So I don't know if you can guess where this is going. But for the sake of argument, let's imagine that our senior leadership team needs to make an important decision. And we can start with an um, orange node for a CTO um, who is male and traverse the graph and ask ourselves how many women are likely to be involved in any given decision-making chain. And my findings echoed the study, way less women. And you might think, yeah, but obviously, because there are fewer of them than men. But there's something else at play here. So OK, in, in, in the study, in the idea sharing or innovation network, um, the researchers found that this network had 22% more same gender ties than would be expected if we gave no consideration at all to gender. Um, and women are less central than men, and they're also absent from some areas, and they have fewer inbound connections, which essentially means that few people come to seek them out to discuss new ideas. So the hypothesis is that even if you have as many women as men, you will still have a disproportionate ratio of same gender ties. So why is that? So if diversity is bricks, something called inclusion is mortar. And it turns out that by virtue of our human nature, we are awful at being inclusive because we gravitate towards people like us. This is called the similarity bias. And it means that we instinctively hold back in building relationships with people who are different from us and that we judge others more harshly. And we have a lot of other biases and, and blind spots about people who are different from us. And these lead to exclusion and sometimes self-exclusion. And minority groups often conform um, just to cope or to avoid being stereotyped. And then they de-emphasize their otherness and adopt the traits and behaviors of the majority. So I'm a huge fan of American TV shows. If you think about the high-powered women lawyers in suits, if you've seen that show, you'll notice a lot of masculine behaviors. This happens because we, as a society, we portray the majority as a prototype for success. But in doing so, we effectively deny everybody else the right to belong. Um, so people from minority groups are often assimilated or excluded. And when it comes to actively including others, then the majority group often puts up resistance because they perceive reverse favoritism and they feel excluded from diversity initiatives. So yeah, that's, that's all a bit worrying. And underrepresented groups face bias like this day in, day out, and stereotype threat. And, and um, face empathy gaps and have ambition gaps and, and are constantly bombarded with societal cues that are internalized. And this, this kind of thing wears you down. And that's why for minorities, opportunity doesn't necessarily translate into professional achievement. If you think about it, your career progression depends on taking risks and advocating for yourself. And taking risk and advocating for yourself is not going to be at the forefront of your mind if you're just grateful to have a seat at the table, to be there. Because um, if diversity is being invited to the party, inclusion is being glad you're there. Another variant of this quote is being asked to dance. But if you're an introvert, that's kind of exclusive. Thank you, Safari. In other words, <laughs> there's not much good in having diversity without um, inclusion. So this seems like an obvious point now, maybe, but you know, diversity plus inclusion equals a happy, uh, vibrant, and welcoming developer community for us all, and diversity plus inclusion equals a safe place to work. But is, is, is all of that obvious? Um, is it obvious to all of us in tech? Um, I took a look at the Stack Overflow developer survey for this year, um, which asked developers how they evaluate potential <laughs> jobs. And 30.4%, which is the majority of respondents for this question, said that diversity was their lowest priority. And it also, it, the survey also showed that different types of developers have different priorities when they consider jobs. 
So gender minorities rank the office environment and the company culture as their top priority. And the other 90-something percent of respondents uh, rank how much they're getting paid the highest. So like, we haven't even got the basics. The Stack Overflow um, developer survey made me really sad. And <laughs> I hope it's an eye-opener for you as well. But I'm not going to make us emigrate to the moon because I will try to answer the question, how? How are we going to take down the barriers that stand in the way of a truly diverse and inclusive tech industry? And we can start by admitting that there are things in our power that we can do and acknowledge our collective and individual responsibility to make things better. And there's no magic wand or quick fix, but um, there's a few things that you can do right now. And the first one is pledge to do no harm. So just make an effort to be kinder and more compassionate and stop and think before you speak and act. And to do no harm, you have to start by understanding um, your own bias, because we're all biased. Um, and understand your own privilege, size it up, and keep it in check. And neither of these things is obvious or easy, because they require a lot of introspection, which is hard. And they require a lot of honesty, which is even harder. And they require research. Um, but there's a lot of that on the internet, thankfully. And I'd like to suggest that you could use a website called Project Implicit to find out some of, uh, some of your implicit associations with regards to gender, race, sexual orientation, and, and many other topics. The second thing you can do is you know, hire people people, people who care about diversity and inclusion, and hire them from underrepresented groups. And this is super hard. And you're going to meet with opposition. I invariably, there's someone who says, yeah, diversity is important, but we can't lower the bar. This bar is bullshit. This, this bar is a consensus that comes from a privileged position, which was held for a long time by the same majority that is part of the problem and not the solution. So I think it was last year that an internal study at Google found um, no correlation between an, interviewing sa an interviewer saying hire and someone actually being a good or bad hire for the company, which means that no one in tech actually has a bar that works very well at determining good versus bad hires. And that's regardless of ethnicity uh, or gender or any other diversity variables. Okay. Maybe someone will just say, yeah, you know, it's important, it doesn't matter about the bar, but not enough minorities are applying. This is something called the pipeline problem. And if you encounter this, you have to ask yourself why it is there, and then try and fix it. So a good place to start is usually job descriptions. Um, there's the obvious things like leaving Node Ninja out, and we have beer pong. Um, and you know, maybe maybe you don't have that. Maybe you have a list of bullet point requirements. Uh, you have to understand that lists like that implicitly select implicitly select for the majority, which will apply when they meet a lower proportion of your criteria. Studies show that's at sixty percent versus minorities, which will only apply if they meet most of all or all of those requirements. So. You know, besides common sense and, and empathy, there are tools like um, Textio that can help analyze your job descriptions and find more obvious points for improvement. <coughs> okay, so maybe you don't have uh, job descriptions with bullet points. Maybe what you really care about is uh, someone's GitHub or blog or their open source contributions or uh, their public speaking record. Um, so yeah, how many underemployed single moms do you think you'll hire? Probably not that many. If your job is to build the best team, you have lots of strategies to, to getting there. But if your strategy is to hire the best candidate for the role uh, without regard to the team's composition, and it leaves you with a weaker and less diverse team, then that strategy is failing and it needs to change. Um, so I, I really like that um, Ben uh, clearly argued that diverse teams are important and, and better. So I have a 
mental list of products built by teams that weren't diverse. So things like every inaccessible website, or uh, hand dryers that only work for white hands, or seat belts that cause spinal injury in women but not men. So yeah, you have to build diverse teams. And, and you can't just expect people to show up. You have to reach out to underrepresented groups and actively seek them out. And there are ways to do that. Um, a good place to start, for example, is Twitter. And you know, once once you've built this diverse team, and once you've reached out, you also have to remember to support and nurture people because underrepresented groups have to prove themselves to a far greater extent than everybody else. So there are studies that show that men are promoted based on um, potential, while women are promoted based on past achievement. So you can't just hire people and leave them to get on with it, because that's not going to work. You have to have their backs and be a mentor, be a sponsor, and be there for them throughout their career, and give them opportunities as, as they grow. And you can do that by advocating for others, and, you know, taking time to give recognition, using any platform you may have to shout about the triumphs and the challenges that minorities in tech face. In other words, you should aim to become an ally. And all of us can be allies for each other. Uh, we can do that by building up our social intelligence and our empathy and, and getting comfortable with tampons and pronouns and starting by learning the language used to describe disability and ethnicity and sexual orientation or religion because it really matters to people. So if you don't know, just, just ask and listen and try and become part of the solution by supporting minorities in the workforce and, and beyond. You know, maybe be an equal partner or an equal parent. Um, and I have to take this opportunity to bring up Tampon Club, um, which is essentially just a group of people leaving tampons and sanitary towels in um, their workplace toilets so that they're available when they're required. But remember to put them in both bathrooms because someone might be transitioning. Also, this is something that no one ever thinks about, uh, but baby changing facilities should also be in men's toilets because there are single dads. <coughs> yeah, leave no one out, no matter their gender or ability or race or class. And notice those, and, and really see those who are around you. And even more importantly, perhaps, um, notice those who are missing and should be around you and treat everyone with the same respect and compassion and without prejudice. Because you have to actively and, and consciously build and maintain inclusive workplaces or inclusive conferences, inclusive meetups, um, inclusive panels and working groups. And, and you, know, you have to actively use inclusive language, like don't say guys, and you code inclusive forms by leaving out the male, female, other radio buttons, and you know, consider those who don't drink beer, perhaps. And speak up, because silence serves no one. Especially speak up when others can't, because maybe they lack the confidence or seniority to demand that a problem be fixed. And uh, you know, don't be afraid to call out bad attitudes or behaviors. In other words, do what you do if you weren't afraid. Um, because we stand on the shoulders of those who came before us, uh, and now it's on us to create that change. Um, and for that change to happen, you have to be bold and aim for the top. And you know, this is going to be scary, but getting rid of any internal barriers that might stand in the way is critical to gaining power and social impact. And, and that's entirely up to you to do. But be your true self and refuse to be someone you're not. And you know, it's okay, don't worry if you're uncomfortable or your slides don't work. It's okay to be awkward and it's okay to have little confidence because breaking down these barriers inside you will um, ultimately help create psychological safety for those around you. And if you're a minority, don't just accept the status quo or get complacent. Um, you know, stand up and do something about it. And don't say stuff like that on Twitter. I have read this in a, like at least three bios. Um, I fit all your quotas, and it's super funny, but it's quite unhelpful. Take responsibility for your words, the, and especially do that as you get more senior or gain more influence, because people will actually listen. 
So you can use that privilege to support and boost the people who need it most. And it's only you can help normalize allyship. Because if you're a person with privilege, it's much easier for you to advocate for allies. Listen to people. And pay close attention to marginalized voices. Give them your full attention. Don't interrupt. Instead, learn to echo and attribute what you hear. Um, but make sure that you have access to a broad range of views. Um, if you're on Twitter, I am, I really enjoy Twitter, you can use a website called Diversify Your Feed. Um, and it's a website that tells you how gender balanced your Twitter is and offers suggestions of whom to follow to improve that ratio based on your interests. It's really good. Yeah, you, you don't. You, to make sure you have access to a broad range of views. This happens offline as much as it happens online. Uh, because you, you have to get out of your comfort zone and make new connections and make new friends and diversify not just your um, social media, but your social circles. And you, well, you should do this just to broaden your perspective. And you should do it with intention and with compassion. So we have this thing at work called Donut. Um, Donut is a Slack bot. Um, and um, Donut um, arranges coffee meetings, or just, you know, like half an hour coffee, at a frequency you get to decide, for me it's once a fortnight, with a random person you haven't met before. And these are really excellent ways, A, to get out of the office, and B, just, you know, get to know people you wouldn't normally speak to and, and see what, their, what the challenges are that they're facing or, or, or just build up friendships. It's really great. I recommend it. And, you know, start by making the effort to find out what others are going through. But don't make assumptions because you're not the savior. Instead, maybe you can join some support groups, or if your workplace doesn't have them, you can start some support groups. We have FT Embrace, which is the black and um, ethnic minority group. Um, we have FT Proud. Uh, we have FT Women. We have support groups that I found very, very helpful to converse with and that are gaining a lot of profile. Celebrate diversity. Make it an inclusive celebration for all of us in tech. You know, ask, ask people to dance if they come to your party. And hold yourself and your team accountable for creating this change. Because tolerating difference is not the same as embracing it. Tweet this slide. Um, so yeah, check your bias, reach out, hire people who care. Because tolerating diversity is not the same as embracing it. Thank you very much. Don't use Chrome Canary. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, I think we have uh, five or ten minutes for questions, if anyone has any questions. Um, if you're a, a, an introvert and a bit of a social numpty like me, uh, how, how do you make that first step reaching out without sort of, hey, you're a minority, how can I help? Um, it's sort of in a less patronizing <laughs> way. <laughs> <laughs> you, you absolutely can't do that. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> The way I've done it is just by trying to make friends with people first and, and not feeling like you have to help, but feeling like there is a shared problem that you can solve and that, you know, it will make your life better and your team better and your product better um, to have more varied views around you. Um, you should totally not do that and just be more assertive if you're a hiring manager and just say no to like super homogenous CVs and stuff like that. Hi, um, I just want to thank you. That was a really interesting talk. Um, uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm kind of thinking the whole, especially with women in tech, there's kind of a short-term and a long-termness to it. There's the fact that 
you have people, women who are in tech, but how do you attract them into your company, for example? And then there's also the long term of like, well, there probably isn't a very big pool of women in tech at the moment. So maybe my question is going to be about the long term, is how do you address women coming in, you know, make it, making it a career choice for women? I, okay, so I think that is a um, wider societal problem. And the way to address it would be by ensuring more and more representation. Because nowadays, um, in, in Romania, for example, more women graduate um, with STEM degrees than men. But what we're really bad at, and this is pretty much universal everywhere in the world, is at promoting minorities. So you get a, a sort of a lot of juniors, and they get to, to mid-weight, and then they don't progress much further than that, and they don't become principal engineers or these visible role models that can then I inspire uh, people to choose that career path. And there's lots of other problems, like the schooling system that teaches uh, women to, um, you know, just make an effort and, and, and study and be quiet and be good, when in fact the things we prize are more like assertiveness and confidence. So um, I, it's, this has certainly been the case for me, but what's inspired me uh, most and given me um, the most drive is having really visible women at the top layers of your organization um, and sort of being able to reach out to them for advice. So I just kind of wanted to say that was really a great talk, and I appreciate that you mentioned the intersectionalities of things. I think that tends to go missed. Not so much a question, more of a suggestion to that comment earlier. Um, reaching out to minority groups, start by finding people in your field on Twitter, I would say, in those groups, and talk to them on Twitter before you walk up to someone in real life and do it. Because um, <laughs> if you share a common interest with someone, that could be your topic versus, hey, you're different to me. This is why I'm talking to you. Um, but yeah, really great talk. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Hi, thank you for your talk. It was it was really good. Um, how do you do? You have any recommendations for how you can avoid the onus of all this kind of change falling primarily on people in underrepresented groups? <laughs> <laughs> um, the emotional outlay is real. I, uh, you know, we often have to advocate for ourselves. Um, the how how you can avoid the onus falling on underrepresented groups is, you know, if you're in a position of privilege or if you have a platform and you're in a majority group, start by lifting those people up. If you have a meetup and someone comes and does a talk about a non-technical subject. So this is funny story. This is actually the first ever talk I gave in a lightning talk format, and I gave it at the London Web Performance Meetup, which was my first web performance meetup. I gave it several years later for Christmas. And I was so nervous, and I had the best introduction. Someone just came, the, the organizer of the meetup came on stage, just like, you all should listen. This is important. So it, it, it's little things, and if it's if you're in a position of power or if you have a platform or if you you know just take that soapbox stand on it and um, make those changes to um, your company's diversity policy or start uh, including more um, speakers from underrepresented groups at your meetup or you know if you have a woman on your team stop asking her to organize your socials it's things like that Hi. Um, so you said uh, on your job application form shouldn't contain uh, bullet points and things like that because people don't apply if they don't fulfill all the criteria. Have you got some examples or know of any where there are good job adverts that might be inspirational? Mm, I could, and I fully intend to make up a list and tweet about this. It's not so much about not having bullet point requirements, it's applying them with a pinch of salt. 
So what made me apply to the Financial Times was uh, the women who code job board. And I just incidentally checked it. And I noticed they have a really good way of highlighting benefits like flex flexible working and childcare vouchers and things that matter to me. Uh, even though that job description was perhaps not perfect, the way in which it was presented and the whole interview process from then on didn't put me off and didn't intimidate me. So improve your job descriptions, um, choose the right channels to spread them around in, um, make sure you have you use inclusive language and make sure you are a good place to work for someone from an underrepresented group. Thank you, everyone. I'll be very careful with my uh, collective nouns, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> It is, it is an incredibly important subject and, uh, and a fascinating talk. Thank you so much. Um, we'll be back here in an hour, uh, so 20 to 2. Um, so there's a lunch break now for an hour. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.